Hello and uh, welcome back from uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, we have now officially entered the festive season. December is here, the Christmas songs are on rotation, the trees and the lights are out and the shopping is on. Uh, we are in the third someone in this series, Eliminate Hurry, and today I want to talk about the discipline of simplicity. As we unpack that, let's just talk about this last weekend, you know, Thanksgiving uh, all the way to Cyber Monday and what represents, uh, what that represents in our culture and behavior. You see, according to Adobe Analytics, uh, consumers spend over $5 billion on Thanksgiving over $9 billion on Black Friday and over $11 billion on Cyber Monday. Now, if you add Saturday and Sunday, the total spend over the five days goes over $35 billion. And please note, this does not even include in-person sales, which suggests to us that you're probably looking at upwards of $60 billion just in five days. Now, when I look at these numbers, they are staggering to me. To think that we can spend these billions of dollars for consumption in five days, is astounding. Now, you may agree or disagree on whether the numbers are significant enough, but there's one thing that we can agree on, and is that this says much about our culture. It says much about our behaviors. You see, as human beings, we have this insatiable desire for more, and it's not the same things for all of us, but it is the same desire with different things. You know, it could be clothes, it could be shoes, it could be food and gadgets, uh, uh, or maybe for some of us, it's just even the household items, you know. Uh, we clearly never have enough, and this is not just an American culture, this is a global pandemic. You see, and the irony of it, especially here in America, is that it's more more pronounced on Thanksgiving weekend, you know, and I, and I wonder, I wonder whether we are telling ourselves thank you by spending money that we do not have on things that we do not need. Uh, now, I, even as I, as I get into the message, let me clarify something as I talk about simplicity. You will hear me talk about our possessions and the things that we consume. I am not speaking against possessions. I believe that we should be able to enjoy what God has enabled us to have. Uh, what I would like for us to do is to put those things in perspective of our identity, who we are in God and our purpose what God has called us to be and do. So let me just pause there and pray, uh, even as we get into the message today. Father, I thank you so much, and just grateful that even as we're going through this series, Eliminate Hurry, um, I pray that Lord may our uh, spirit just be uh, calm, uh, especially in this time, that we shall be receptive to what you have uh, to say for us today. Thank you that Lord, we can find uh, uh, just uh, uh, a place we can find refuge uh, in your word. Uh, so I pray, Father, would you use me even as I bring this message. Holy Spirit, would you inspire us uh, to be able to see, uh, hear, and even apply what it is that you have in store for us. And Lord, may our hearts be ready, uh, not just to hear, but also to do what you're asking us to do. So, Father, I pray that you remove any distraction from our minds uh, and, and allow us, Father, to sit in this moment um, and just receive from you. Uh, so Lord, would you bless us? In Jesus' name I pray. You see, we've made life to be about the insatiable desire for more, and we spend hundreds of hours convincing ourselves and even doing research as to why those things are what we need to give us contentment. But then as soon as you get those things, you are on to the next. So, so here's what I mean. You buy a new shirt or a new phone, and as soon as you get it, you start thinking about your next phone or the next shirt. We have perfected the art of anticipating needs. I know, I know I will need this one day, so let me buy it now because there's a deal. I don't need it now, but I will need it later. And our online carts are filled with things that we have saved for later because we are anticipating the need we shall have for those things. You see, there's something about the human psyche that quickly adapts to a new normal. Uh, 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 let me try and unpack it. When you, left, when you left high school, you know, all you wanted was for you to go to undergrad, you know, get a well-paying job and maybe even get married. Then you come into a city, especially like DC, and you realize the person to your right has two masters and the one to your left has a PhD in metaphysics. And now all of a sudden you went to do masters in human psychology or some weird program that just makes you feel good about yourself. You know, you, you, you fasted and prayed and all you wanted was to buy an apartment. You didn't care which direction the kitchen faced, you know, or even whether there was a kitchen and, and God blessed you until your friend invited you for an open house or you visited your colleague and their house has an island with chandeliers and your entire Uber ride back home, you're on Zillow or Redfin and you're trying to figure out what is on the market because now you want to change homes. 
All you wanted was a car. It didn't matter the brand. It didn't matter the color or the size or of the engine, you know, uh, as long as it moved. Th then you saw an ad or your friend carried you in their brand new SUV and you realize it's not just about the movement of the car. It is how the car moves you and the experience it gives you while transporting you to your destination. You know, all of a sudden it's an experience, you know. Suddenly, uh, what made you content doesn't anymore. And the desire for more keeps increasing and, the, and that brings complexity. Everything you buy not only costs you money, but also costs you time. And the less money and time we have, the more hurried we feel. This is what I mean. You see, what started as a reaction, you know, you, you saw the car and you react, you're like, whoa, you know, what turns into an idea, you know, and you start thinking about, you know, what, what could it be if, if I got a newer car? Uh, and then that turns into a thought, you know, and now all of a sudden, it's a series of thoughts. You're like, you're trying to convince yourself of how you can make this work. And what was never in your mind before has now permanently taken residence. And now your life is reoriented to try and get that car or that house or that dress that you saw. You see, you, you are already barely making ends meet, so, so you need to figure out how to make that extra $300 in car payments. You know what I'm talking about. But it's not just that, it's also the insurance because the insurance has gone up. You know, now you've bought a new car and, and now you need to keep it clean because it's a new car. And, and, and you also want to wash it regularly. So it's another like $50 a month uh, on top of your bill. Before this, you probably gave little to no thought about your transportation needs. Now you have committed your money, but not just that, you've also committed your time to this. And the bigger problem is that this is not the only thing that is preoccupying your mind. There's a list of maybe five other things and, and now there's much more complexity in your life trying to make life work. Uh, maybe some of us are listening to this and you're like, me, I'm frugal, so this is probably not for me. Uh, 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 I don't worry about that. Uh, but before you let yourself off the hook, it may not be material things, but it is your time. Of a schedule is the name of the game. One look at your calendar and it will make someone's head spin. There is this insatiable desire to keep going and, and keep doing more and more. And, and you never say no. And at work, you're always saying yes. And you might be even subconsciously competing with your colleagues on who is the busiest, you know. And you find pride in that. And we feel like we shall be content when we do more. It's one activity after the other. You used to hit the gym, but now your friend is running. And so you also want to do that too. And your schedule keeps expanding with things that you want to do and keep on adding. And so when we contrast our lives with the subject of today, which is simplicity, I, I dare say we are far from it in very many ways. And, and you get into scripture, and you know, I found this in the best sermon ever preached, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and Jesus shares some very, very simple and, and profound words. And you find this in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 25. And this is what he says. That is why I tell you not to worry about every day life. Now, I want you to highlight that because I have brought us right into the middle of a conversation that was already happen, happening. Rather, Jesus has been speaking for a while now and he's about to finish his sermon. And, and in verse 24, if you go a verse uh, earlier, he says what gives us great context to the message uh, today. And he says this, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, the word used for money here, mammon, represents what we own or even desire to own. So you cannot serve your possessions and claim to serve God at the same time. When you read through scripture, you know, uh, uh, it, it is confirmed over and over again that we were created to worship. Let me sort of zoom out a bit and help us understand. In Genesis chapter one, we were created in the image and likeness of God. And to be made by God means that we were made for God. We were made to love him, we were made to know him, we were made to be in relationship with him. And the way we do that is through our worship of him. So you cannot worship without devotion. You cannot worship without dedication or sacrifice and commitment. Worship is in us whether we are intentional about it or not. But then what happened is that sin cuts us from our creator and there was this separation between us and, and, and uh, between us and God and, and Jesus had to come and bridge that. However, we who are made to be worshipers can never stop worshiping because that's, that's who we are. Your, your entire life, our divine image, Imago Dei, was custom made 
to be devoted to God, to a higher calling. And, and when we don't worship God, here's what happens. We naturally create idols in our lives. So when you wake up in the morning, naturally, whether you know it or not, whether you are intentional about it or not, you're looking for meaning. You're looking for value. You're looking for spiritual fulfillment. And your time, your sacrifice, your dedication is devoted to that thing or that person. There's a higher calling. The question is where? You're custom made to worship. The question is who? And, and so Jesus here is addressing the idol of our possessions and desires because you devote your time and money to the one you serve. Your dedication, your time, your sacrifice is revealing of who you serve. So remember I said at the beginning that this message is not speaking against possessions but to put them into perspective. So, so, so let's pause and look at our time and money. Where is most of your money going to right now? Probably your mortgage or your rent. Okay, let's take that as an example, which makes that your most prized possession. You know, uh, every month you have to make the payments, which means you have to maintain a certain income that is way above your payments, you know, at least for you to make it. The, the house is a great blessing. It's not a bad thing, all right? It's a great blessing. These things are meant to be enjoyed and you're probably using it even to bless many others. However, I think here there's a caution because it is usually harder to tell when we cross the line. All of a sudden, this becomes the thing that you must do. Your whole life is devoted in paying for the house, uh, uh, furnishing the house, maintaining the house, and woe unto you if you visit your friend's house and see all the nice gadgets and they have, and now all of a sudden your house looks older and, and you need new stuff. And the very thing that was meant to be a blessing is now your master and you're the slave. It is the God and you're the worshiper. So, so now when we get to verse 25, you're beginning to understand and we'll continue to unpack this. That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food? In fact, before even you get there, here's the thing. Jesus is like, I'm not even going to talk about the big things. The house and the car and your career. I, I want to break it down for you to the bare minimum, hoping that you'll grasp the importance of what I'm saying to you today. In fact, it's so simplistic, you will at first feel like I don't even care about your concerns. I know you're worrying about your job. I know you're worrying about your house, but that is way above your pay grade. You should not even be worrying about that. Those are not even things you should be giving as much time as you currently do. You shouldn't even be worrying about whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. You see, the word worry means this, allowing one's mind to dwell on actual or potential problems. Mental distress or agitation resulting from concern, usually or for something that is impending or even anticipated. Jesus says, I'm telling you today, do not allow your mind to dwell on whether you have enough food. Do not allow yourself mental distress on what you're going to wear. Do not be agitated about what you shall drink. Do not worry about the basics of life. And then he asks this question, and when you read it, the, the tone suggests that you should already know the answer to the question. He says, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? In other words, who you are, who you are becoming, is more important than what you partake or what you put on. And, and just in case you still don't get it, let's, let's read from verse 26. It says this, look at the birds. They, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly father feeds them. And, aren't you far, and, and I want you to highlight this. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have little faith? Continues verse 31. So don't worry about this thing saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. The basic needs for survival are food, water, clothing, and shelter. And Jesus says, I tell you not to worry if you have enough of these. He doesn't say do not eat. He doesn't say do not work. No, he says do not worry. 
Do not dwell in the thoughts of these basic things, let alone those other things that are bugging you. Because Kevin, here's what I want you to understand. When you worry about these things, your thoughts are that I haven't blessed you enough. This is what you're thinking. Or that I'm not hearing or understanding your needs. Your, your, your questions are probably, why would I allow you to go through what you're going through right now? These are the things that dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And unbelievers do not have a relationship with me, so they do not know me. And what I want to point out to you is that worrying about stuff in your life, whether you'll have enough to eat, whether you'll have enough to drink or wear, reveals what is happening inside of you. The, the, the discipline of simplicity is not about possessions or lack thereof. Simplicity begins with a deeper understanding of who you are to God and trusting him enough to care for you. Simplicity is a gift. It is not the absence of gifts. And this is the best gift that you can give yourself in this holiday season. Simplicity is understanding your true value in God and trusting him enough to care for you. If all you're concerned about is what you will feed yourself with and how you will look tomorrow and what you will drink, then that is your God. Mammon, your possessions are your God. Your physical well-being, if that's all you're concerned about, what you worry about consumes your time and your money. That is where your dedication, your sacrifice is devoted to. It reveals something that is much deeper, that you do not understand your value to God. And because you do not understand your value, you will continue to pursue these things to give you value, and they will never. Kevin, the complexity in your life is fueled by your low understanding of your value before God. You're concerning yourself with things that you should, in the chaos and complexity is revealing the state of your heart and who is God over it. For you to sit there and think that I can clothe the grass in the field and, and feed the bird in the air and not take care of you shows how little faith you have in me. Simplicity has nothing to do with abundant possessions or lack thereof. Because for the one who has limited possessions, even the ones that will say probably are poor or they don't have many options, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're living in simplicity. This is about all of us and everything to do with our inner being and how we understand our value in God and whether we trust him to care for us. Jesus was the embodiment of simplicity. I mean, study his life and you will see the principles he lived by and what he concerned himself with in spite of the culture. So then what do we do? How do I start to live a life of simplicity? I, I, I don't remember who quoted this, but I love, the, I love this quote, uh, 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 so it's not originally mine. A, a habit can only be given up for a greater habit. So I say, let's not worry, worship. I love Matthew 6.33. It says, seek the, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. Our human mind tells us that we get our value from hard work. We get our identity from what we do. Look at what Jesus tells them. He didn't just tell them to stop warring. He, tell them, he told them to replace worry with a concern for the kingdom of God. Concern yourself with what I want and who you are to me. The things of my kingdom. And live according to my word and I will take care of you. You concern yourself with the right things and I got you. Please note that this does not excuse reckless living or sinful living. So don't go living precariously and expect that God will still meet your needs. So, so for those of us who maybe it's a time issue, trim your schedule and say no to things that are not concerned with the kingdom of God. Probably you need to evaluate your job or your relationships because they are leading you to duplicity more than they are leading you to simplicity. Your, your calendar should show you how you're worshiping God. Every time you find yourself dwelling in the thoughts of tomorrow and whether you will make it, find your way to worship him. Whatever it is that you need to do, maybe it's to turn on that worship music. Every time you find yourself, oh, you're worrying and you're concerned, you're anxious about what will happen tomorrow or, or that situation, maybe pick up the Bible. And read and, and remind yourself who God has said, uh, 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 what God has said even about you and, and who you are to God. May we find ourselves back to worship, back to that heart of worship because it will remind us. 
Second thing that I want to suggest to us is instead of buying, give. You see, again, a habit can only be given up for a greater habit. What, what, what if, and I, and I know this is going to be challenging for many of us, what if we only bought the necessary needs for our home? What if we only bought groceries for the next 60 days? Just buy exactly what you need for the day-to-day -day living. And I know Christmas is here, uh, uh, but think about it for a moment. Maybe sitting in the discomfort of not buying stuff to fulfill our desires can give us an opportunity to find our true value in God and not in those things. And I acknowledge it will be hard for some of us. And when it gets too hard and you really want to buy that thing, I want to suggest, why don't you just give it a few days before you make that purchase? When you really feel like, I really, I must buy this thing, give it a few days before you make that purchase. Next year, on the 9th of January, we're going to be beginning our prayer, uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. That is why I'm saying 60 days, you know, if we can extend this so that it can carry us through into that season of prayer and fasting. Instead of buying, give. Instead of just thinking about what I can buy for myself, give. In fact, start with decluttering your house one section at a time. You will be surprised at the many things that you don't have. Don't keep things that you haven't used even in the last three months. Maybe you don't need them and you'll never need them and you don't even need to use them. Bless someone even within our congregation. Bless someone. Bless your neighbor. Let us create a culture of blessing one another. You see, you may have a nice jacket or a nice dress that can fit someone else. Give it to them. This is not to shame one another. When someone blesses you with something, rejoice and give God thanks. And maybe if you feel shame, then maybe you need to interrogate what is going on in your heart. If you feel shame when someone blesses you, maybe you need to ask yourself, why are you feeling the way you're feeling? I love what Richard Foster says. Simplicity is the only thing that sufficiently reorients our lives so that possessions can be genuinely enjoyed without destroying us. But remember, remember the words in Matthew 6.33. This is not to be done in isolation of Matthew 6.33. We must seek first his kingdom before anything else. Simplicity can also become an idol when it takes precedence over seeking the kingdom of God. So it must be done under that overarching thing. Do not worry about tomorrow. This is what Jesus says, I got you. But just in case you still doubt, Kevin, I want you to look at the lilies in the valley. I will take care of you. Stop trying to cover yourself with every new fashion trend. Only I can cover you. Only I can cover your shame. Only I can cover your pain. But just in case you're still wondering whether I will take care of you, I want you to look at the birds in the air. I, I will feed you. Do not keep worrying about food. Concern yourself with my words and you will get to know me and you will know how much I love you how much I value you, how much I care for you. But just in case you still doubt, I want you to look at the cross. I gave it all for you so that you can spend eternity with me. So why would you worry about tomorrow and what you will eat or drink when I gave up everything so that I can spend forever with you. I want us to pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that today someone will just get that affirmation of the fact that Lord, you love us so much. So much. That you gave your all So that we can spend eternity with you. And the pursuit of the things of this world, sometimes, in fact, most of the time, they cause us to miss out and to forget who we are in you. And so we've made our lives complicated with the things that we do and the things that we buy, the relationships that we are in, Lord, you're calling us back. 
and we're in engaging in these things because we, we have a low understanding of our value in you and how you care and love for us. Lord, I'm reminded of the words in, uh, that you taught, in fact, even Matthew chapter 6 earlier on of how we need to pray. You taught us how to pray that let your kingdom come in our lives as it is in heaven. And so, Lord, I thank you because in heaven there is no disobedience of your will. And I pray that that will be the same in our lives. But also I love the words that you taught us. Give us this day our daily bread. And that is a reminder. It's a reminder, oh God, who should be our provider. But also how much we should ask for today. Give us today our daily bread. So Lord, deliver us from our greed. Deliver us from our desire to control Deliver us from our desire, Lord Jesus, to play God in our lives. Oh, have mercy for the times that, Father, we have missed the mark. And Lord, help us. Teach us like Paul to be content, whether we have little or whether we have none, uh, or whether we have much. Lord, teach us. Teach us to be content with what we have, oh God, because it is what we have, and it's what you've given us. And the Lord, you will take care of us. So Lord, I thank you. I pray that our hearts will be stirred up to begin to choose to live lives of simplicity, always living for you and seeking you. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this reminder. And so even as I bless us as we go into the week, I want to use the words in Matthew chapter 6 says, so don't worry about these things. Saying what we will eat. What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Then he ends by saying, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. God bless you.